Okay. Um, in this transition phase, um, I would like to uh, invite the audience to, or I'll remind you that there's a chat function and that we invite you to post your questions and comments. My colleague, Lea Klim, will uh, select and cluster them. Um, but before I turn to the audience, I would like to have one round of, of questions back to our panelists. We have heard very different perspectives here today. Florian talked about the post-growth perspective. Um, jo Johan talked about uh, uh, yeah, a very different approach from a more historical perspective, um, yeah, looking at the macro level. And Cora talked a lot about the more the micro level, uh, individual skills and competences that we need for change. Um, so I would like to ask all three panelists um, how could these three perspectives uh, go together? Um, what is necessary to make socio-ecological transformations a success while at the same time creating a post-growth society? Um, what are the central elements of a strategy to get there? Um, does anyone want to start? Florian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. So. Um, yeah, um, so, sorry, uh, Johan, we, uh, could you close your presentation so that we can see your video? And can you hear us, just to be sure? Yes, we, s we see you're not frozen. Is it not closed? No. Strangely, it's closed on my... Um, it's just can you, maybe you can stop screen sharing? Yes. Okay, wonderful, we can see you. Okay, and now over to Florian. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, I see a lot of connections between uh, the different perspectives. Um, um, but I want to pick up also some challenges, I guess, to the other speakers. So um, I find Cora Christoph's uh, take um, fascinating. And I think there are a lot of overlaps, uh, I think, with the perspectives that Jordan and I presented mm -hmm. in terms of the experimenting, in terms of thinking about this as a process of systemic change, in terms of stimulating sort of pioneers that want to make this happen. Um, but in your perspective, the, the question that sort of popped up in my head was about the connection between your different levels, if you want, mm -hmm. because you, you spoke initially about um, the skills at an individual level, which I think is very important. Um, uh, and then you talked about the, the process of systemic change overall. And the question is, what happens in between? Is there sort of a meso level of, of, uh, of analysis, but also mm -hmm. of action in terms of collective action uh, for these transition processes? Um, in, in terms of the sustainability transitions literature, um, our argument was to say, well, we need to um, draw more on, on this literature. Um, but what I didn't say, and I want to say now, that of course, in our reading of the literature, in lots of the transition research, there is also this usually quite implicit assumption in the sense that economic growth will and, and should continue. And in my point of view, from my point of view, that's also uh, partly a conceptual heritage of the innovation studies field, where of course innovation is seen as something positive uh, because it is contributing to uh, economic growth and social welfare and international competitiveness. Um, so my challenge in a sense for uh, Johan uh, would be that, would you agree that the core mechanisms in a lot of our transition frameworks are about stimulating alternatives, as you've said, upscaling them, investing in alternatives, huge infrastructure uh, investments. So in a sense, aren't these exactly the recipes that are now su suggested in terms of uh, a recovery program? And isn't that a growth program at the end of the day? I was very pleased uh, to hear what you said about transformative innovation outcomes and that that should be the, the new focus and economic growth is, is a byproduct. But, um, Sort of, I can see how politically uh, this is easier than the post-growth message um, that uh, you mentioned. But I was uh, wondering if you agree that the core mechanism uh, of innovation in these transition frameworks uh, are actually potentially a driving force for growth. Thank you. Johan, do you feel provoked enough to respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, the first point I want to make is to say that no one can control transitions or transformations. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a very complex process. 
so therefore, in our approach, we try to work with actors to say, how can you become more transformative? Because in reality, what we see with the agents we work with, and these are science, technology, innovation agencies, uh, they start a project with transformative aims. For example, in Sweden, Finova had a challenge-driven innovation program, but the end result is quite conservative. So it does not end up in a lot of transformation. So I think uh, our method is aiming at how can you become more transformative from your own point of view. Uh, so, and we translated it into how can you nurture better niches, how can you better expand them, and how can you open up regimes for change through your project program uh, policy. And then we work in a reflexive manner. Uh, it does not guarantee there will be a transformation, but nobody can guarantee that. Uh, so it's a navigation process. Uh, and as I said, it's a very complex process. It takes many decades. Uh, and I don't think there's a real recipe for strong acceleration, except if uh, there are shocks like COVID, but also economic recessions, they may influence the acceleration. And uh, so building niches is important because when time comes for real change, there need to be alternatives. Mm. So it's also building preparedness. Johan, uh, uh, can uh, I also pin you down on the issue of growth? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I come to that. Uh, Florian's that. question then, was uh, was about uh, yeah, if there was a uh, some path uh, dependency built in with innovation uh, processes towards growth. Okay. Yes. So innovation uh, always has been seen as positive. Any innovation, a strong message we work with is that innovation can be very negative. So it's an issue of choice. So which type of innovations do you want? And this choice should be part of the uh, of the process. So uh, if you focus on renewables, for example, instead of fossil fuels, you may indeed still generate what is called economic growth. But it will be a different type of growth. Uh, if you focus on local food production, instead of globalized food production, you may still uh, generate growth. But the overall effect will be a different type of growth uh, with completely different characteristics. Uh, sometimes the debate about degrowth and growth is in itself kind of tiring <laughs> and doesn't lead to uh, uh, political action. But, but so, uh, if, if I may so intervene, do you think it's enough to be agnostic about growth, or what's, which exactly. position would you take? Yes, yes that's <laughs> the position of Kate Rayworth, uh, because she also argues that economic growth fulfills some positive, has positive consequences, certainly for lifting the poor out of poverty. Uh, so, we don't know, in fact, and the economists don't know what will happen if there is less growth, because if there's less growth, we have to realize our complete tax system relies on growth. Mm -hmm. So if the, the way we measure it today, uh, so we need a complete redirection of the tax system, in fact. Uh, but instead of focusing, so in that sense, it's a political strategy, instead of focusing on the definition of growth, we say, okay, let's make sure that the activities we do deliver on the sociological and ecological consequences. So let's focus on defining the consequences, and we have them defined through the SDGs, and delivering on them. Okay. Then we will still have a new type of growth, could be post-growth, as a byproduct. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I would now give the floor to Cora and uh, ask also uh, Florian's question again. How do we get from the individual level to the collective? Mm. I think the three per perspectives we heard uh, in the keynote have a near uh, connection. It's not different uh, things. It's different views on the same thing. 
the second uh, I want to say. Uh, we have a lot of ex post uh, research on why happens success or why not. And we have not so much research on the ex ante question. What should I do if I want to be successful? And so I think uh, Johann and Florian told a little bit on this theme too, but I think we have to think more. And I think Johann said it's more like a searching process, what should I do and, and so on. I think what we know are the central success factors uh, and the central patterns. It's not like a recipe. You have one kilo of that and two gram of that and one liter of that. You have to have this success further in mind if you go in a changing process. The third point, Johan said, uh, and Florian too, it's a long time to be successful in transition processes. If we have a look in the digital revolution, we see very fast changes. Could we use the knowledge of the reasons of this fa fast uh, changes for our ideas? What can we do uh, to make the two, two big transformation to sustainability and digitalization make um, a connected uh, change? So it could be um, a new way of coming to success. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've uh, received a signal from my uh, colleague Leah that we have uh, a discussion in the chat and we would I would now like to invite her to uh, give us an overview of what's been happening there and uh, pose some of the questions to our uh, keynote speakers. and also Klaus Jakob. Timo asks, well, we've, we've talked about different concepts, but who should actually put them in practice? Because a lot of the time, we, um, uh, they are context-specific in terms of which actors um, should, uh, should um, implement them, sorry. Um, but scientists often do not um, clarify of who should be the one that's putting them in practice. And Klaus Jakobs goes as far as, as saying, well, a lot, of um, a lot of actors have actually become quite active during the, the COVID times, but specifically politicians are lacking behind. So what can we do to enable politicians to move forward as well? Second questions I have from the chat is from Benjamin Görlach and Bernd Siebenhühner. Um, they say, well, in COVID times, we see a lot of experimentations, if that's in school or the workplace or even this conference, but very little of that experimentation is actually guided by a big vision. A lot of it is really born out of necessity and it's perhaps the second or third best option. So how can we still use that, that impetus, that momentum and learn from that collective experience? And the third question I picked up from the chat is from Steffen Lange. He says, um, and that is specifically um, directed at Johan, he says, as far as I understand, the first deep transition brought about um, the industrial society and brought about capitalism. Does that imply that the second deep transition now moves beyond capitalism? Or what's the relation to that? I'll leave <laughs> that up for now and we'll pick up more questions later. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would like to then, let's start with the first question. Who should put this uh, into practice? And I thought maybe Johan likes to start because you work with a lot of international actors around the world. Maybe you can also say something about differences between countries um, in terms of picking up such uh, impulses. Okay, um, who should put it in practice? I think is in a one way easy to answer because there are many actors working on transformation. It's not like we have to start a transformation. There's a lot happening in the world, in fact, because we talked about all the negative trends. But I also encounter a lot of activity in Colombia, in South Africa, in Senegal. Uh, uh, so for me as a researcher, the question is, how can I assist them? So this is, and how can I work with them to make them more effective. Uh, and uh, of course, with whom I work depends a bit on, uh, it's partly contingent, but there are many groups and certainly uh, uh, the ecological 
Economy Institute is uh, is one of them. Uh, so, uh, uh, though that's so, I, I should not be too concerned about who should we uh, who should put it in practice. I am concerned about inclusivity, because if you look at who's involved, then in these processes you can see that certain actors are in excluded, and in science, technology, innovation, it's often civil society and users. So part of our work is include more actors. And here there is a real difference between, uh, for example, Latin America and Europe, mm -hmm. because in Latin America, civil society is far more active and far more integrated into university research than in Europe. So in Europe, many universities are really silos and, and disconnected from uh, actual practice. Uh, I leave it here. I yes. just answer the first question. Yes. Yes, uh, we will return to capitalism in a moment. Uh, <laughs> I, I would like uh, to uh, ask uh, Cora to go second. Uh, you could probably you meet you work closely with politicians, mm -hmm. so maybe you can uh, tell us um, about the question about lacking behind. Mm. I think the first and the second question are directly exactly. uh, mm -hmm. combined. Um, if uh, I should say something to the first question. Um, I think we should be more in contact with the representatives of resistance. We talk together. Here in the room are the typical people and I think the people on the computers are the people discussing with us since years. So uh, I think we should go out of our silos. Um, we should go to the people with other uh, ideas. That's the first question. And so, um, to lacking behind, um, I, dang, I think um, we need a big vision, not only for the ecological society, we need uh, visions and narratives for all people. We come from a niche with our ideas and want to be uh, Yes, we want to be the normal case, and so we have to speak with the other people, not only with the little group in the little silo we are in. So, mm -hmm. I think this is the answer to these two questions. Yes. Okay. Um, Florian, if you want to take it uh, from there, maybe you can uh, say more about yeah, how to pass it on, and then we also lead over to the question of capitalism <laughs> and return to Johan uh, after that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, who should act? Well, I, I, it's, it's everyone, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, this is a, a transition process is, is not something that can be steered top down. Even the most powerful government in the world think China is not able to enact a transition by decree. It depends on many decisions by uh, lots and lots of different actors, from companies thinking about their investment decisions, from financial institutions thinking about where they're putting their money from, civil society groups uh, uh, developing alternative uh, ideas about how uh, we could uh, organize our economic activities uh, uh, in the future, from uh, academics working in a transdisciplinary way with stakeholders on the ground to develop these visions further, to develop um, tools like Johan is doing, strategies. Um, so it's, it's all of the above. Uh, and I think in terms of politicians lacking behind, I think there are a number of political strategies, and, th and this is a, a point I wanted to make anyways. These processes are political. There are winners and losers, potentially. Um, and so this is not necessarily something that will only emerge once everyone uh, is uh, convinced that that's the right direction. There will be also discussions, as Johan was suggesting, about the direction in which we're traveling, uh, and, and uh, actors will not necessarily agree. So I think what's really important in the sense of the question about uh, how to make politicians act, I think there's um, a number of strategies. One is um, uh, building alliances between actors in the sense like Cora was suggesting, that are not normally around the table and are not normally politically aligned. Think uh, um, green uh, NGOs together with trade unions, unions uh, who are often very concerned about job losses uh, in, in certain economic sectors and so on and so forth. Um, also include welfare organizations. Um, 
and to uh, really work on questions around a just transition. I think that uh, can be a step forward. Of course, also movements out on the street, if you think about Fridays for Future demonstration, that puts pressure uh, on politicians to act and not to lag behind. Um, but also in terms of new economic actors emerging, if we think about the uh, energy transition in Germany, um, the political cloud that developed by uh, hundreds of thousands of people having PV on their roofs, um, those are all voters. They want to protect the subsidies for these types of activities. There's a whole industry that supplies the machinery uh, to produce um, the panels and so on and so forth. Um, so that is also a kind of becoming a political uh, coalition uh, that can um, steer activities in the right direction and counter act some of the uh, incumbent forces. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we now turn to the third and last uh, question about capitalism. And uh, Johan, you can go first. Maybe if someone else wants to comment as well, I can give you the floor too. Did you, was Thank the you. question clear? Yeah. Yes, mm. yes. Okay, the, that question is a big one. Uh, it also depends on how we define capitalism. Mm. If you define capitalism as uh, accumulation of capital, so in, in the hands of a few people, at the expense of many other people, yes, this is a core problem. And, uh, and in sustainability transitions research, the role of finance has really been understudied. Uh, I am working now with uh, investors, and I mean the process of setting up a panel of 16 huge investors, private and public investors, uh, to uh, come up with a new type of investment philosophy together. Uh, to stimulate uh, transformation, because the current investment strategy are either, either about divestment, not investing in fossil fuels, or impact investment, but they do not consider transformation. So yes, uh, redirecting uh, finance uh, is certainly on the agenda and should get a lot more attention, but, I, but this would still be within the confines of capitalism because it's about how capitalists behave. Uh, a second definition of capitalism, it's all about the market. So the market can solve the problems. And I think uh, this definition has, is, is uh, you know, we should challenge it. Uh, because markets are embedded, uh, markets need to be regulated. So here we need a lot of change. Certainly also a change of the financial sector by a lot more regulation. Uh, so I would say we really need to challenge capitalism, this focus on, mar on markets. But I would like to make a third observation, because uh, after Marx, we had Schumpeter, and Schumpeter said the essence of capitalism is not the, uh, the finance, but it's innovation. So with the uh, Industrial Revolution, what happened is that we set innovation free. So people can innovate, like uh, the digital giants, without thinking about the consequences. They are not responsible for it. And this is a core problem of modernity and of capitalism, that we have this divide between those who promote change, not being responsible for the consequences, and those that have to bear the impacts and the consequences. So what needs to happen, and that would be a fundamental change of capitalism, is that uh, the ones who innovate are responsible for the consequences. So we, we do away with the concept of externalities introduced by economics as a discipline uh, to justify this. Uh, uh, but we have to realize, and that's the reason why I work on science, technology, innovation, this is a core vector for change. And uh, Cora talked about digitalization uh, and being fast. Well, it started in the 70s. Mm. So, it also took decades for digitalization uh, to really become effective. And, uh, but I think digitalization is crucially important for uh, the second deep transition, uh, but it can still go in many directions. Mm. So the question is, how do we digitalize? And uh, I don't need to tell you that the, the, the current direction of some of the giants is not very positive. So we need to challenge, you know, uh, the big American companies uh, in the way they operate. Thank you very much.
uh, for giving such precise answers to such a huge question and also different angles on it. Um, Florian, I don't know if you want to allude to how capitalism features in the post-growth position um, or how it doesn't feature. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up from way, um, Johan because the, the question was initially about the sort of the deep transitions framework and I think it's the point is not that the first deep transition brought about capitalism, it brought about a particular form of capitalism. So it's the nature of, of that capitalism that I think Johan and colleagues uh, have studied. And it's really this Fordist model of uh, growth through mass production and mass consumption, selling more and more products and services to people that we don't necessarily need. Um, so I think the challenge now is to reform capitalism in a way where these core norms and rules according to which this system works uh, are bent in ways towards a sharing economy, uh, towards a platform uh, economy, uh, with alternative uh, economic actors. The role of cooperatives, for example, is, is something we're interested in in our research uh, to counter sort of the, the global emerging giants that uh, Johan was, uh, was talking about. And I think also, of course, the, uh, in political science, there's a whole literature around varieties of capitalism in the sense that sort of Johan talks about the global um, rules that guide uh, this type of capitalism that we currently have, but at the same time, uh, there's also uh, variation. So what I said earlier about uh, transitions being the outcome of decisions of many different actors uh, is not supposed to be misunderstood as uh, not governments not having a strong role. Uh, I think uh, governments will need to have a very strong role um, in this um, transition. Uh, I think this is one of the core themes also of the conference that we want to tackle in terms of the balance of uh, p power between sort of state and market actors and civil society. Um, and uh, the kind of shareholder capitalism that Johan was talking about um, uh, is probably not the way to go, like we've seen uh, mainly in the US and in, in Great Britain and so on and so forth. But of course, in, in the European uh, countries, we've uh, de developed a more cooperative form um, of capitalism with um, uh, strong welfare states uh, and strong governments. Uh, and I think that's um, what we need to develop further um, and uh, to develop a new social contract, as it were, for this uh, second deep transition. Thank you. I think, um, Florian, you should tell a little bit about the project post growth and the precautionary principle. I think it's very important in this uh, discussion. Sure. Yes. Um, so this is a, a, a project we uh, completed about uh, two years uh, ago. Uh, it was funded by the um, Federal Environment Agency, and it was really the first time a sort of um, public uh, sector organization in, in Germany dared to at least have that in the title. Um, it is, of course, an extremely uh, controversial uh, topic. Um, and what <coughs> made the project extremely interesting was that we were working together with colleagues uh, from other institutes, the RWI, for example, as well as the Wuppertal Institute, uh, which you wouldn't normally see working together on such a project. Um, and so the approach of the project was to have these both perspectives, in a sense, represented the green growth perspective as well as um, the, the more critical perspective on growth and to try to see if we could find at least some common ground. And, and um, the idea was to develop a position with this precautionary um, post-growth approach which could um, become a sense, a, a new platform for actors to latch on that are not normally on the same side uh, and to adopt this position that we don't say uh, outright growth is bad, we don't want growth, we are a, a degrowth uh, activist, but to say, well, we're not sure. I think this is actually a very clever and very uh, politically elegant turn to say we're not sure and out of precaution, therefore, we can't rely on uh, welfare systems, on the tax base um, to come uh, uh, in the way we've uh, had it so far. So um, 
that's why we think it's a quite an elegant uh, position and, and are it continuing to argue in favor of it. Yeah. Before I hand back to, to Leah, I would like to yeah. give Cora the, the floor. Maybe you can also say something about why this project was so well received by the Environment mm -hmm. Agency. <laughs> <laughs> um, the project was my idea and I was <laughs> really surprised that the project uh, could start. We have to communicate with the ministry and so on to have this project. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's a little surprise that the project can start. I think the, the core message of this project is neoclassical economics meets um, post-growth um, people. And they have a common, um, common idea in the end of the project. And this says, if you change something in a systemic way, uh, use a not gross um, connected solution. And I think this is a combination of people saying this could be more um, sensible in the discussion of capitalism, post growth or so on as other things. So I think it's a very important project. I'm very happy that the uh, uh, the person uh, dealing with this project are uh, working in this field uh, in this uh, times now. Yeah, so it's also um, a way of breaking the deadlock between yes. degrowth or green growth. Yes. Uh, and yes. I think that's the, the new main perspective. Yes. Okay. Well, now we hand back to uh, uh, Leah for questions from the audience. Yeah, we do have a couple more questions. First question comes from Frederike Rode. She asks. How can we stand up to powerful actors who have an interest in maintaining the growth-oriented status? And related to that, Leonie Fritsch asks, what are the old narratives that we have to leave behind and what are the new ones that we want to spread? I also have a question from Jan Nil. He asks, what are the most ex important experiments to set up and which ones should be chosen by whom to disseminate them? And another question comes from Jenny, Jenny La Kumar. She says, how do we get from pilot projects and niches to, micro, uh, to, to the macro level or to the mainstream in the context of sustain sustainability transition and digitalization? And the last question I have for you goes specifically to Johann Schott, again from Steffen Lange. He asks, what are the empirical indicators that you have that there is currently an entirely new regime developing at the moment that, that might bring about that deep transition? So what's the empirical we, have to, we can look out for? Okay. I leave it at that. I think plenty of things to discuss for you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so uh, we move now to questions of power and how uh, to confront uh, existing power relations. I mean, maybe, uh, Cora, you want to start because uh, you talked to us earlier about uh, how to embrace uh, resistance. Mm. Uh, but yeah, what are um, possible inroads without being overpowered by those actors? Mm. I think um, it's a never-ending story to uh, work with resistances and to overcome uh, them. Uh, and I think uh, the first point is to understand it. Um, what are the reasons, what are the different interests uh, in uh, these resistances? And um, in the first step, uh, you can have a look on the type of resistance. Have the people problems with the process? Have there other interests? What are the reasons uh, that they resist? And so uh, the reasons which are, uh, are the, the, the which are connected with the process, with the agents uh, uh, in the process, with the timing, with the, uh, with the production system, uh, can be solved in some, some, some case. But uh, on the end, you will have to deal with uh, interests and you have to find solutions to um, what will we do with the disadvantages? What will we do with the solutions? And so uh, we have uh, to go out of our silos to develop solutions with the people of other interest to um, define processes with these people um, and then go together to a new direction. Uh, and uh, the solution will be another solution we thought in the first idea. 
and uh, what we need are our core um, vision, our core goals to come to this direction. But the way will be another. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, to navigate. Johann Schott said it's uh, navigating uh, to come uh, to a successful uh, solution. And I think we have to be navigators uh, in this way. And we have to love resistances and the power which are in the resistances. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was wondering if uh, Florian and Johan, if you have uh, examples uh, um, about where you have worked with powerful actors who used to be the enemies and maybe trying to find common ground. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Florian? Yeah, let me uh, <laughs> preface this with the, the more general remark that, of yes. course, uh, uh, power is extremely uh, important. There are many powerful actors mm -hmm. in the world that are uh, trying to uh, either prevent this uh, from happening or slow it down or direct it uh, in, in avenues that make sense for them. Since you were asking about examples, I mean, the, 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 the oil and gas industry for a long time uh, has been denying the reality of, of, of climate change, then been denying that it's a man-made. Uh, now reluctantly accepting that it is happening, but still predicting a, a, a viable future for the e economic model. Um, uh, and then uh, um, when it was up to them to develop some strategies, uh, develop uh, strategies, for example, around carbon capture and storage, where they can use their existing assets and their existing capabilities in the sense of, and then presenting that as a vision for an electricity transition, we can stick with centralized power, uh, fossil fuel power uh, plants, uh, and just uh, do a bit of end of pipe technology. So I think that's uh, that's one of the strategies of so-called, what we in the transitions community call incumbent actors. Mm -hmm. Sort of, It's not that they don't move, uh, we also call the regime dynamically stable, because of course all of these companies have to constantly reinvest their capital um, and the question is where do they uh, put that investment. I think that the main political strategy actually or in the transitions literature is to uh, leave the comments alone in the first place and empower the alternatives. Um, which would lead to the second question, which experiments should we be uh, looking into? What Do you have uh, any favorite ones that you want to mention to Jan Nil? Yeah, I think, I mean, there isn't the experiment that can solve this uh, problem around sustainability transitions, as I think you uh, very well know. So let me just reflect a little bit on the uh, experience of using these transitions ideas in, in Dutch uh, national energy policy. Um, and the approach there was, uh, they used some of the ideas uh, of the transition management literature, and the idea there was, okay, we know which uh, sectors and systems are difficult to decarbonize around mobility, around energy, uh, agricultural system is, of course, e extremely important in the Netherlands uh, and, a, and a huge energy user. And so they separated this out, this overall transition, in different areas and said, okay, we need to talk about mobility, we need to talk about electricity, we need to talk about um, the agricultural system, and then established uh, a group of uh, so-called frontrunners, so people who wanted to make a change, not invite the incumbents along, but a group uh, of, of stakeholders from civil society, from academia, from um, um, public agency and, and policy makers uh, and really try to develop a vision for where do we need to go in terms of um, sustainable mobility, for example, in the Netherlands. Uh, they then developed a range of um, possible transition pathways to say, okay, um, we, we want to be here in terms of targets, in terms of use of biofuel in 2030 or 2050. How can we get there? What are the different routes of getting there? And then they had a public uh, funding program that selected uh, experiments that uh, were sort of exploring some of these transition paths um, that um, were proposed by this panel. So I think that uh, it was an interesting process architecture. I'm not saying it worked well, because as Johan uh, reported early on, even people who set out ambitious targets often then come uh, to fund very uh, conservative experiments. So I haven't found a magic trick to avoid that. Maybe Johan has, so he can talk about his experience with that. Um, but uh, I think uh, th that's the point about uh, the choice of experiments. Uh, but of course, that is now we're talking about public funding programs. And the majority of all experiments that are going on out there are driven by actors that want to see a change in the world and make it happen, and therefore are not selected in a sense by anyone, but is by sort of uh, people doing it. Okay, um, I hand over to Johan. How do you deal with powerful actors? And which experiments do you find strategically the most important? Well, there's a whole uh, 
range of, of ways of dealing with them. The, I was part of this uh, Dutch experience that Florian talked about uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, in the end, we were uh, kicked out, uh, partly because of Shell. And uh, the Netherlands have not really advanced the uh, uh, energy transition because of the, the powerful fossil fuel industry in the Netherlands who have uh, stopped uh, the process. Uh, so an outcome of the work we did in the Netherlands was that we went to court. This is done by Agenda, the famous climate case, I think, and we won against the Dutch uh, state. I can tell you now that we're also considering a, a court case against Shell. Uh, uh, so uh, part of the things we, we have to confront and, uh, and uh, also as researchers to provide evidence uh, because you could say that investing in fossil fuels may become a criminal act. But in the court, you know, you need evidence uh, uh, for that. So, uh, but of course, the other way is to work with them, because from transition theory, we know, and from historical examples, in the end, some of the powerful actors need to migrate and become niche supporters. So the question is, how do you do that? And for that reason, I, for example, at the moment work with these investors to develop alternative scenarios and a new investment philosophy with them. Of course, for, this is, for them, this is a window to see what this would mean, whether they would implement this, or how they will respond to this. That's uh, uh, another question. What we did agree on, that the scenarios would be radical. So I, I said, I want to exclude incremental scenarios. And they agreed to that principle. Uh, so working with them, building alternative practices, and sometimes really challenging and resisting them and support the resistance. Uh, because in the end, transition is a political struggle. Uh, well, successful uh, niches, there are many. In fact, the point is there are many. Uh, uh, in South Africa, there are many alternative ways of securing water. At the same time, there are droughts, you know, because there's a dominant way of, su of su supplying water which does not take into account the ecological infrastructure and doesn't use it. It doesn't want to address the farmers. It doesn't want to... Uh, so we... Uh, so uh, in terms of alternative energy uh, in South Africa, uh, a large part of the population has no access to any infrastructure for electricity. And electricity is key for developing of an economy uh, and for education, for example. But there are, and there's hardly any solar, for example, not enough. So you can think of experiments with alternative, you know, renewable energy in South Africa in the townships. That's highly relevant and important work. Okay. Thank you very much. I will hand over to Cora, and then we also we already have to come to the concluding uh, question. Okay, um, Florian and uh, Johan pointed uh, out the important role of niches and experiments. I want to add uh, the level of politician uh, discussion. I think we need um, transformative politics in the energy sector, mobility sector, housing, and uh, so on. And we have a discussion of a big mix of uh, policy instruments in every field. And I think we have to discuss what are the most transformative parts and wo why and, 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 and in which part of the policy mix we should focus at the national level, EU level, international level in the current uh, situation. And now it is another situation in the European level and the national level. And so we have to focus on the most uh, transformative policy instruments and to to make a orchestra of different levels. And so it could be more successful to come to the big transformation uh, we want. Thank you. Yeah, um, the, my concluding question to all three keynote speakers is uh, returning to the conference theme. Um, will it be different this time? Um, and 
I would also like to integrate in this uh, Steffen Lange's question about uh, are there any indications, are there, is there any empirical evidence for um, you know, a, a deep transition at any level? Um, is there uh, any indication of hope? Um, and um, yeah, what is necessary to realize a new pathway now? Florian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So, I think from the transitions literature, we learn that um, shocks can move transitions along. Uh, as Johan said, it's an open-ended uh, in which direction this will happen, but I think this uh, does open up um, space. Um, I think, I mean, will it be different this time? It refers back to the financial crisis in 2007 and 8. Uh, where similar questions were being raised about our economic and social systems being fit for purpose and where people then very quickly went back to the business as usual kind of uh, acting. But I think we are in a different situation now compared to 2007-8. I think the climate and biodiversity impacts became much more visible and pressing. Um, I think the fact that there uh, is a global movement out on the streets today again and to put pressure on politicians, on companies, um, to um, make a change. Um, I think that uh, alternative ideas and, and paradigms, if you want, for example, around circular economy, are starting to diffuse and uh, being implemented. Uh, and of course, also, uh, Cora mentioned, of course, the important uh, European level. Of course, the European Green Deal is maybe not all we had uh, hoped for in terms of conditionality and where is the investment actually going. Um, but I think it could provide uh, a boost if, if uh, that money is spent well. Uh, so all in all, I think if all of us push as hard as we can, I'm optimistic that 2020 <laughs> can be a turning point. Thank you. Thanks, Florian. Um, what about Johan? Maybe you well, can please integrate the question <laughs> if there are is empirical evidence. Um, that would be great. I'm a moderate pessimist. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, and I'm an historian. So, I think we are back in the 19th century. And what mm. happened in the 19th century there was a looming revolution. Uh, there were many problems in society. There was no strong state. You know, there was an industrial revolution going in, causing havoc in the world. Uh, and it took 50 years or 60 years to come to welfare, to the welfare state. But in between, we had two wars, as we all know, big shocks. And uh, in this period, there was a lot of experimentation with alternatives uh, going on. Uh, so a big question is, can we avoid uh, um, uh, these huge disasters, including war, to get to a uh, more sustainable society? But because I think it will come because you know, of the disasters looming, uh, because they are real and they will cause shocks. The question is, how prepared are we? So part of the, the work we do is about creating preparation, but I'm quite convinced that uh, shocks will play a large role in the directions that we will take. And hopefully the shocks are not too severe or do not implicate war. Uh, and this is a bit the, the pessimist uh, uh, side. And of course, there is ongoing world in, uh, war in the world. We don't have to be negative about this. About the empirical indicators, okay, so we are working on that, in fact. This is a very important thing, because uh, we have indicators for all type of impacts, but we don't have indicators for transformation processes. But you can measure the development of niche processes, the opening up of the regime. Uh, so we're working on indicators uh, for this, and uh, it would take a long expose to talk about the details of the indicators. But yes, uh, there are uh, indicators, and uh, but it needs a lot more work. Um, can you uh, name at least one particular? Well, the quality of the networks in society, so the diversity of the networks, uh, whether they are open for change, for example. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. 
Okay, Cora, how pessimistic or optimistic are you uh, that this <laughs> year 2020 will be a turning point and will be different this time? I've been very optimistic. Um, the first um, view I want to do to our society of transformation and sustainability society. I think uh, it would, would be uh, different this time when we learn to be more reflexive, when we learn to love resistances and to use them and use the success factors for um, change. And uh, I think we should come out of our silos. It's very important to be a broader uh, view. If I have a look to the world uh, outside of our, of our silo, I see um, change in the culture. Uh, today we have big demonstrations. Uh, it's only one part of the changing culture. I see um, green finance initiatives. Um, money is changing the world. If money is used in another way. And I think um, we should and we could use uh, the transformation of digitalization uh, to come together with the uh, transformation of uh, sustainability. And we had to connect both uh, uh, transformations. And so my conclusion is it could be different this time and we should do everything that it will be reality.